Well, Aram, I, I appreciate you being here with me on the Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation Podcast. For folks who are unfamiliar with you, would you mind introducing yourself and letting us know what it is the type of work uh, that you do in the world? Okay, my name is Aram Terry. Um, and before I get into it, I want to thank you for uh, for inviting me and and taking interest in our country, in our company, and, and what we're doing. Um, I uh, I have a company based out of Nicaragua in Central America uh, that that's focused on reforestation. Uh, but our our concept is uh, to make reforestation profitable through 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 uh, adding value and and making end user products selling straight to consumers. Um, so um, I've been here for 18 years or so learning about wood, learning about reforestation, learning about manufacturing. And that's, that's, that's what our companies are about. Masayan Company and Guayacan. Hmm. Well, I, I do appreciate the, the focus first and foremost on reforestation. I, I do think that your description there understates the absolute beauty of, of the products that y'all make, all the furniture, uh, and as well, those, those prefabricated homes that you have with uh, Guayacan uh, as well, just absolutely gorgeous. So I do have to, to say that first, first off. But um, I, I would love to start perhaps 18 years ago, if you wouldn't mind. I, I'm curious because from what I understand, it was uh, the, the Peace Corps that brought you to Nicaragua. Right. And I'm wondering what what inspired you first and foremost to join the Peace Corps and do something like that? Okay, so I'm I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, went to school in Boston at Boston University um, for uh, for business, study business administration with a focus in finance. And um, during during college, one one semester, I went over to Spain and started learning Spanish. Started, you know, opening my eyes to the rest of the world a little bit. And uh, as I was graduating, um, you know, a lot of my friends were applying for jobs in New York or staying in Boston or looking for finance jobs, but that didn't really appeal to me. And I, I wanted to look for something where I could travel and uh, see more of the world and learn how to speak Spanish, um, kind of broaden my horizons. And uh, actually my father, um, when he was graduating from school, um, you know, in the early seventies, uh, applied for, for Peace Corps in Costa Rica and got accepted and decided to go to law school. Both he and my mother were actually accepted the Peace Corps in Costa Rica, and and my my mother went to to study, um, got a master's in in special education, and my father uh, studied law. And so he, and my father, really kind of pushed the Peace Corps thing on me, so he could live vicariously through me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, looked into it, and you can't really pick what country you go to. Mm. Um. But uh, I knew I wanted to learn Spanish, so I basically picked Latin America, and they sent me to Nicaragua. Mm. And that was in uh, 2002. And at that point in time, uh, not a lot of websites about Nicaragua, so I actually had to go to the library and check out some books. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all the books at that point in time were about the revolution. There were hardly any travel books. Mm. And so I really had no idea what to expect. Um, and came down here and, and kind of fell in love with the place. Um, lived in a small fishing community for two years and just kind of, you know, saw what was going on, saw a totally different place from where I grew up. Um, you know, an economy where uh, people live off of $100 a month, $150 a month, instead of scraping by, you know, with $2,000 a month. Mm -hmm. So it's just... Uh, very eye-opening and uh, to see, you know, how different the world is in different places. And, uh, you know, and, and at that same time, you see how people have so much less, but are managed, are, are able to be happy, mm -hmm. are able to, to survive, to get by. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I just kind of really liked the place. And after my two years of, uh, of Peace Corps, wasn't re ready to leave. Um, so, you know, one thing led to another. 
um, worked in um, real estate development in a beach town called San Juan del Sur for a couple of years uh, with some friends. Uh, through doing that, um, met a, a French agronomist that, that has been here for a long time who has several tree farms. Hmm. And, uh, it, you know, I was working in coastal development, selling kind of like beach homes or, uh, you know, developing some properties, that kind of that kind of thing, and would drive by uh, this, this French guy's uh, tree farms every day. So I'm doing that over the course of three years and just watching the trees go up and thinking, huh, I'm in this sales business. And then this guy has the business where he's reforesting. And basically when it rains and, and when photosynthesis happens, he's, he's, that's the business. He's making money. Uh, so I don't know. The, the idea of, of reforestation as a business was just very interesting to me, intriguing. Um, so started the company in 2008 kind of with the idea of doing a couple tree farms um, just to try it out and see, you know, learn about it by doing it. And um, so, but at the same time, in late 2007, there was a hurricane on the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, which is kind of a, a sparsely populated area that had a lot of forest. And, um, you know, this was pre-2008, we were doing pretty well in real estate things and thought we could do anything. So when the hurricane happened, we decided to get into extraction and milling of hurricane felled lumber hmm. um, out of trees that were knocked down by the hurricane. Um, and, you know, I was younger, uh, you know, 20, 20, well, you know, almost 30 then and uh, had, had been, you know, the business that I had started had been successful, you know, small businesses. So this undertaking, you know, sure, we can do it. And basically went uh, to the Atlantic coast with heavy machinery, milling equipment, trying to recover this, this wood and really got, got beat up. <laughs> uh, major learning experience on many different fronts. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but the process was, you know, we, we get into the, the processing of wood at the same time that we got into the reforestation efforts. Mm -hmm. So pretty much from inception, the company has been about planting and converting wood into to final product. Hmm. Um, and, and could you say more about what some of those lessons were at that point in time? Well, it was, uh, there's a lot of business lessons where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, things, the learning, just learning new business without, without getting into it, without having any idea what we're doing. You know, it was easier in real estate and some other things, but with the wood, it was a lot more different. But the bigger lessons that I learned, you know, long-term, we, we got over the operational issues and, and kind of stabilized. But uh, the biggest lessons I learned out there, you know, when I went out to this, what was I expected to see was a fallen forest. Um, when you get out there, really, you know, you had to go really far to find the forest at mm -hmm. that point in time. And it was a part of this country where when you look at the map, you assume it's like an Amazon and it's a jungle. But when I got out there, it's, it's a cattle farm, you know, mm -hmm. everywhere, as far as the eye can see, it was cattle. And you basically anywhere there was a road had already been cut down and turned into a uh, pasture. And to get to the fallen forest, you basically had to go to the areas where there were, was no road. Hmm. And so the, the long-term learning experience was, was more about uh, poverty, uh, the effects on the forest, um, and, and, and what's really happening, you know, on these, you know, areas where none of us ever go, you know. And so as, as far as you could go in Nicaragua, way out in the middle of nowhere, there's a, a poor farmer who is cutting down the forest, uh, living in a little zinc roofed uh, house and trying to make a living, mm. you know? And uh, it, so it was really eye-opening to see the advancement of the agricultural frontier front firsthand mm. and re realize that as much as people talk about it, even the government here or anywhere to control that is, is a very difficult thing. Mm. You know, people are gonna try to make a living and it's really, you can't really blame them because they can come back to the Pacific coast 
and and swing a machete for $170 a month or uh, go turn forest into pasture and basically triple the value of the land. Hmm. So it was just a shocking experience to, to work out there and understand that economic effect and why why the report deforestation is happening hmm. and it from what i understand it, it your your father came down with you in in 2007 to start that business is that right right so um yeah our business from the inception was a uh, family family finance friends and family finance mostly my father and his his business partner hmm. and what, what was that experience like working with him on that that endeavor um, it's been good, you know. Uh, they've been uh, very patient through all the uh, all the learning processes because it has been a long process. We've been operating now for twelve years. Um, you know, it's been overall a positive experience. But I, you know, if I were to do it again, I probably would go look for outside investors because I feel like uh, working with family is difficult, um, and it, it can affect relationships, especially when things aren't going well. Um, so good and bad, <laughs> I would say there, there, there was, there were parts of it where we're very stressful and, and, you know, affected our relationship. So, um, but in the long run, we, we, you know, we have overcome it and, uh, and everybody's, everybody's content now. Well, I mean, uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. Um, but it, so I, I guess you're, you're there and you're experiencing, something unexpected you know what what you're seeing the the catalans out there um and starting to get a sense for what what's happening with this deforestation problem um what what did you learn about it and how where at what point did the trajectory start kind of shifting for you in how to work with that environment work with those uh, um i guess challenges well i guess what i realized was that effect of deforestation is a macroeconomic and, and governmental issue. Mm. And uh, as long as you have poverty in these areas um, and uh, no, you know, a forest is a, is a private property mm. and you can't just say, don't touch it. You know, um, there has to be some kind of income to the people who hold it, or they're going to do, they're going to look for a way to live off of it. Cause a lot of them, you know, in the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, a lot of them are indigenous groups. And that's what, that's what they have. It's a massive asset that they really can't get much value out of. Mm. Um, so the, the amount of guidance and government uh, help it to, to make that a sustainable model is, is kind of mind boggling. So kind of uh, what I realized in, in seeing that firsthand, um, first of all, uh, you know, there are a couple reserves here that might be spared but I see, I think that most of the forest will be removed. Hmm. Uh, I don't see anything. I don't see anything happening on a global level that, that I think will stop it. Um, the, the way that it's moving. So when I thought about what I could do as a, you know, small entrepreneur, uh, is try to reforest, you know, create an alternative instead of having, you know, one cattle per hectare, which is also a, a very marginal business. Hmm. How can we, this area that's already been deforested, how can we turn it back into forest and make it a, a profitable business? Um, honestly, the, uh, the native, the natural forest thing to me was, was quite overwhelming. Like I, I, the, the amount of, of barriers to, to fixing that problem, I think are, 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 are tough. Hmm. So I, I kind of decided my where I wanted to put my role is okay, creating alternatives and 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 how to how to make a business out of reforesting. Hmm. Well, I I'd love to to get a little bit more into the the specific process uh, here in a moment, but are there are there is there potential to convert any of the the farmers to this alternative model? I mean, from what I understand is that you do partner in some way with with other. Uh, um, folks in Nicaragua who are wanting to, you know, take a different model, different path. What, what is converting some of those, even if it's a very small uh, amount? So in terms of getting small farmers to reforest? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I think that is a, a very viable uh, opportunity. Uh, there's another, uh, uh, it's an NGO, NGO slash company here called Taking Root. Mm. Um, would be a good guy to talk to. His name's Khalil Baker. He's out of Vancouver. He is, now that carbon, um, carbon offsets and carbon finance is, is, is becoming more of a, a viable, real thing where you can actually receive them rather than something that you hear about and never see. Yeah. Um, he, he has a, a, an operation where basically they're taking in carbon offset money and paying small farmers to, to reforest their own land. And I think that's a very interesting model that uh, I, I would, you know, we want to see how we collaborate um, or create a, a separate entity that does the same thing. But the more people doing that, the merrier. Basically, being a bridge between people who need carbon offsets and these small farmers who have land that's deforested and, and, and try to make, um, make growing trees on their own land and a, a business for them. So basically what, how it works is you pay them up front and uh, you're basically assuring your, your carbon offset client that the trees will be planted. Mm -hmm. So um, you pay them over a six to eight year period in small chunks until they, the trees are established. And then the trees are theirs. And so what you do is you create a, a, a future, future source of, of biomass for, for cooking or whatever else or, time, or also for, uh, for wood. So that's that, you know, when we started doing reforestation, we thought more about the private held model, you know, buy or rent farms and reforest them and have them in house. But really the amount of impact you can have there is minimal. Um, and we, we continue to do that to the level that we can, but uh, it's capital intensive it's private, you're not helping that much in terms of uh, poverty and that kind of thing other than creating employment. Mm. So I think uh, a large scalable model is, is along those lines, what uh, Taking Root is doing in Nicaragua, mm. uh, which is basically financing small farmers to reforest their own lands. Mm. Uh, and, and so I'm wondering if we can then start um, diving into to y'all's process, particularly uh, just because. Very curious to know, and maybe this is a basic question: is like what what makes your process of reforestation, uh, or as well your process of procuring these building materials, this wood, actually sustainable? Because I think mentally it makes complete sense of, you know, deforested land and it's turned into. Um, pasture for cattle, you know, things aren't being replanted, but going through the thought process of really how long it, it takes to reforest uh, any sort of piece of land uh, and, and what that balance is with the procurement of the materials, the wood, the lumber, I'd love to, to hear a bit more as to, to what actually makes your process sustainable and perhaps in contrast to maybe other more traditional uh, um, means of, of obtaining lumber. Okay, so I think it's it's really comes down to making reforestation a business so that mm -hmm. more people do it and 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 it becomes prolific. Um, and so when I look at what you know what taking roots doing, which we also want to do with with small farmers, we're starting to do it this year. Um, and you know you also have these big institutional plantations where there's some Swiss investments here. Um, there's some other you know large institutional the holders who have a couple thousand hectares of, of tree farms or, you know, our small tree farms, hmm. all of them have the same problem. What do you do with the wood when it's produced? Hmm. And most of them are thinking about carbon. They're thinking about sustainability, but they don't really know wood that well. And so the basic model is we're going to grow this wood, throw it in a container and ship it to India in 20 years. So that's, that's what you do with teak. And so that to me is not, is not, you know, it could be more sustainable. You are capturing carbon, you are reforesting, you're, you're turning something into a, a constant carbon sink, but you're also shipping it across the sea, uh, across the ocean, selling it at a low price. It makes the business fairly marginal in order to export to India uh, and have that kind of, of material flow. You have to be a larger player. Um, so how do you, make it profitable for everybody so, and, and and i think it, it it's it's you know to oversimplify it it's it's adding value you have to create 
factories here that are designed factories which make products which are sold that um that consume this reforested wood and that's something that i think people don't realize when they start planting reforested wood and old growth wood are very different things hmm. uh the the diameters you know like we're when we're when we're harvesting or doing thinnings at year 10 or 12 that you're talking about like four to seven inch trees Hmm. so when you think about that against you know a 24 36 inch mature tree the wood that comes out of it is totally different right. and so if you're you want to sell that to a chinese furniture factory they don't want it hmm. because it's not the spec on what they're producing so to me it's about making a consumer for this very special wood which is you know can be looked at as low grade or you know it has more knots it has more sap it has more pith so how so it's a it's a very kind of complicated process where we have to design and market products that consume this this plantation wood hmm. this is, i can't help but think perhaps to some of the the first replantings that you did if this is a a 10 15 year uh, 20 year trajectory to then thin that wood out what what was the experience? I mean, you must have had a lot of trust in the, that process happening and and being able to to use that wood ultimately, uh, I guess, in a very sensible way or a sustainable way for the business. I'm just wondering, like, what what sort of confidence did you have to have, or what was the the circumstance like to where you're you're invested for 10, 15, 20 years? Because that's how that would ultimately pay I off. Mean, right? I I guess it was, uh, once again, learning by doing. Same thing when we got into the processing of wood. We had no idea what we were doing. It was difficult. We made a lot of mistakes, but we learned. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same with, uh, with planting, you know, what to plant, how to plant it. Uh, you know, our first plantings were not good. Uh, <laughs> every year we get a little better. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was definitely a risk. Um, I had seen other people who had planted. There's other people planting in the area. So you could kind of see you know, they're probably eight years ahead of us. You could see where it was going if you did it right. Um, mm. So, so yeah. Mm. But I mean, you were most cer certainly kind of like both feet in because I mean, it is, it is a five, 10, 15 year trajectory, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's for teak, um, which is, which is kind of the easiest thing to plant on a cow pasture. Um, it, it's because it has a secure market and it grows fairly easily, et cetera um it's a 20 year cycle and you you start thinning at year eight you get another thinning at 12 another one at 16 and then you you do a final harvest at 20 and plant again so mm -hmm. i think it's very important to think about that too because uh to me wood is the only option for building materials mm -hmm. and you know you get pushback from some people saying don't use wood because you don't want to cut down trees my point of view is use as much wood as possible because you're sinking carbon. Mm -hmm. Wood is 50% carbon. So you wanna, as long as the wood is, re, is, is reforested, it's been planted and grown, the more people are doing that, the more carbon's uh, captured, the more soils are protected, uh, soils are enriched, et cetera. So, so um, yeah, I mean, it, it's about, it's about, uh, you know, replanting and, and using wood for sure. Hmm. And, and so is it, I mean, is it unquestionable that the amount of uh, trees replanted will exceed what it is that we're, we're cutting down and using for building materials? I mean, like in that case, if it's use as much wood as we possibly can, like it, are we, how confident are we that we can continue to replant at a rate that exceeds what it is that we uh, take down? Um, there's, I mean, the more you use it, the more demand you create and the more people plant, you know, you, you want to distinguish between native forest wood and reforested wood, but mm -hmm. you look at the U S and, and all the pine plantations and Doug fir plantations, and it's a very sustainable business, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, and the U S is positive forest growth. So you're really talking about um, these places in Latin America or in Africa that that poverty is causing deforestation 
you want to create an alternative for them by growing wood to do reforestation. Hmm. And there's plenty of land to, 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 to supply the needs. Um, you know, they say that in urban areas every year, the, an area the size of Manhattan is created every year across the globe. That's all concrete, steel, and glass. Mm. None of them are sustainable materials, and they're all uh, creating carbon. So um, moving all building and and uh, towards wood is it will have a it will be a key factor, I think, in in, in climate climate change. Mm. And so uh, you mentioned there that the the U.S. actually has positive forest growth. I wasn't wasn't aware of that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so I guess that the conflict is, is where there hasn't been a real incentive or kind of market built for, for reforestation in those kind of mismatches in, in other countries. Yeah. The, 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 the problems that you're seeing obviously are in, you know, the Amazon or in Central America um, and, and Africa as well. Yeah. Where, where they're basically mowing down native forest um, to supply wood for all types of manufacturing um, overseas. Yeah. Hmm. And, and so I guess what, are, are there any other sort of like, what are the, the, the resistances, like what are the barriers and maybe, uh, um, I guess, yeah, resistance that folks have to using wood as a building material? Um, permits, I would think, you know, this is, this is a little out of my area of expertise because I've mm -hmm. kind of been down here more on the forestry and manufacturing side, but um, my guess would be that, that it's, it's, you know, it's a, people are custom, you know, who designs a building, an architect, they're going to pick the materials at the beginning, go with those materials, which are what their engineers know in order to get permits and get them passed. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to change the whole mentality and intentionally from the beginning say this is going to be a wood building mm -hmm. and there is a lot of engineering and new ideas in that area you know can you make a hundred story wood building no not today but hopefully in the future there's mm -hmm. some really cool projects going on um, in Canada a couple in Europe where they're getting to 20 30 stories of wood buildings mm -hmm. so you know uh, it's a giant carbon sink. Hmm. So changing that industry, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of residential houses are already made out of wood, especially in the U S but, uh, moving other parts of the construction industry towards wood, I think is, uh, is very important, but, um, yeah, that's, that's what we, well, that's where we're seeing, uh, that's where we want to focus very long term. But, uh, as you know, this company started, making pieces of furniture. So that's, that's where we're at today. <laughs> well, I mean, and I, I'd be curious to hear about that transition in particular. Um, now with the, the latest company, uh, Guayacan with the prefabricated homes, I'd be curious to hear what, was that any sort of big leap for y'all to go from furniture to now homes and any challenges or issues with that? So basically, I guess, rewinding a little bit. Um, so we started with reforestation and kind of lumber products. And then moving into furniture was kind of a, a first step. You know, we had some local jobs making furniture. Um, I, I started my relationship with my wife, uh, you know, around in 2012. She's a designer, mm. um, anthropologist designer and she uh you know we got into these woven chairs and just kind of ad hoc doing what was coming at us uh, my brother is an artist in in new york and uh so we were making these nice little woven chairs that my wife was designing out of out of wood that we were we were processing and he started selling them on etsy and so we started selling them on etsy then we started selling them on shopify and, and it just kind of grew into a business um, in kind of an ad hoc way, but kind of, you know, doing what we like to do, uh, making pretty things that, that we enjoy making. And, uh, so that's how the furniture company came about, but going back to the original idea of making reforestation profitable, you realize that furniture doesn't use very much wood. 
Hmm. Uh, when you ship a furniture, uh, a container of furniture, it's it's mostly air. Um, hmm. So the I guess the the leap from or the combination of the two products, uh, which are prefab houses and furniture, comes from the concept of how are we going to consume more wood hmm. more than anything else. Um, and I like, you know, we really are, our strength and, and, you know, 80% of what we do right now is furniture. Um, and so kind of the prefab idea is more of thinking long-term mm -hmm. of how to fully consume all of the types of wood that's coming out of plantations. So that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the basis for it. So in y'all's operation, particularly, do you feel like y'all have more wood than <laughs> you can handle? We still ship wood to India. Uh, mm. on a weekly basis um, so you know what we want to do is create more demand sell mm. more furniture sell more prefab houses and and try to not export any wood turn it mm. all into finished product mm. uh, I mean it, it clearly seems like it's like the most logical flow of the businesses that have been started and what you're continuing to evolve you got yourself first into the production of the raw materials themselves uh, which is uh, really interesting and then clearly seeing how, you know, value gets added to the, the end consumer product. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, you know, very kind of step-by-step -step leap uh, to have the, as much of the supply chain as you possibly can have anyways. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering what, what took things from selling these furniture pieces on Etsy to, you know, y'all seeing like legitimately that, oh, you know, we need our own storefront, whether that's, you know, uh, online with e-commerce or, or retail, like what, what was a bit of that, that transition or trajectory there? Well, I mean, you know, there's some luck involved in this, but luckily my, my uh, wife is, was making some very beautiful chairs um, that were selling very well. My brother was doing a great job of selling them and we started seeing them moving. Mm. And uh, so, you know, we put more effort into the design, uh, building out the brand, the brand Masayan Company, um, Masaya is an artisan town in Nicaragua where my wife's from. And uh, it's, uh, it's a really cool place where basically you go to one neighborhood, everybody's making hammocks. You go to the next neighborhood, everybody's making shoes. You go to the next neighborhood, everybody's making furniture. And so it's, we actually, she's, you know, always been interested in learning these artisan uh, processes mm -hmm. and uh, as an anthropologist. And so we would, you know, we started doing our first pieces there. Now, once we had to get into production and actually um, maintain, um, you know, consistency in what we were producing, we did start doing it, you know, in-house basically. But mm -hmm. it started as, as a, uh, working with local artisans. And basically now we have artisans coming into our facility to, to process, just to kind of control things because we are getting to a level where it's production's increasing quickly hmm. um but yeah i mean that's that's kind of the brand the concept of the brand the artisan the um the look of the furniture started selling well and that's where we were like okay this is this is working let's keep going with it hmm. um i i think that's a, a really interesting lesson perhaps for for other entrepreneurs as well as like what what y'all were able to do in plugging into a marketplace like etsy uh, if that's really where sales started to like first take off, I mean, that's, that's a wonderful thing. It's where people all really are. I think that's a great appeal for a lot of businesses with, with Amazon, um, you know, different, different, uh, uh values and, and ethics and everything there than, than Etsy, but finding those places where there are already folks, you know, gathering, uh, that, yeah, I mean, that place. Well, another thing that's been very lucky for us, um, is uh you know the world has evolved since we started making furniture in 2012 2013 now with shopify etsy and um people buying furniture online you don't have to be a big company yeah. to make your own website go through a 3pl to distribute and uh and you know get your brand to end consumers you know before the business model was i'm going to design something pitch it to a big brand and they're going to sell it Mm. And, uh, you know, that, that evolution has happened in the last 10 years and, and we were kind of just right there when it was happening. So, mm. um, that's a part of it as well. And, uh, from what I understand, y'all had a, a really successful 2020 as well, uh, and, and grew rather rapidly. Is that 
would you attribute that to a lot of just riding the wave of that, that e-commerce, uh, or is there something specifically in there outside of that, that, um, you know, outside of a kind of right place, right time sort of thing? Um, okay. So Etsy and all these online platforms, they've been around, mm -hmm. um, for selling products and, you know, and, and so that, that was already there, but what happened, what I've seen in 2019, 2020 is people buying furniture online. You know, it seemed like one of the last industries to kind of go all online because, you know, you want to sit in a chair. <laughs> a lot of people want to sit in a chair before they buy it. Mm -hmm. Well, now less people want to sit in a chair before they buy it. And people are kind of just want to buy everything online or, or, you know, a good proportion of the, the population. So I think that really hit last year. You know, we're still a, a small company. So two things I think are happening. We, we have more market to, to grow into no matter what's going on in the economy. But at the same time, you know, everyone was locked in their house, buying things online. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, be nice to have a nice new chair. You know? mm. <laughs> I mean, with, yeah, without, without the availability of, of storefronts and show, showrooms for that duration of, of 2020, it kind of forced that uh, measure a bit. Um, and and so looking forward, uh, Aram, what what are uh, things that you're you're most enthusiastic about, excited about, uh, um, and hopeful for? Well, we just finished. We're finishing right now a, a fundraise um, to kind of restructure the company and take it past the family phase into more of a um, formal phase, you know, with proper board functioning, et cetera, um, and and continue to grow. Um, we're, we, you know, we're pretty maxed out at our factory. So we're going to grow the factory some more. Um, and, uh, we, we have a, a good group of investors, very social impact minded. There's a social impact fund involved. Um, so they also want us to, you know, one of the goals of the investment is to, to step up our, our social impact as well. Um, that's where we want to, to, you know, make some investments in, in community planting and getting and, and reforestation efforts here in Nicaragua. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's happening right now and, uh, it's very exciting. Mm. And so, I mean, you mentioned kind of at the top of our conversation that you feel as if we're heading to a place in Nicaragua, uh, um, anyways, to where the lion's share of the forest will be removed. If you were to I don't know, have a magic wand and change anything about it, like what, what would uh, stop that, that train? Um, it's about, uh, policy, basically land use change. Um, you know, just weird, weird things where if you want to work with wood, it's extremely controlled because they can control it in order to, to get wood out of the forest, you have to move it on a truck. So they just stop all the trucks on the road. Everybody has to have a permit. Mm. But when you go way back into the boondocks forest, no one can can police that and say, hey, you've got to get a permit to, to change the land use here. You've mm -hmm. got to get a permit to turn this, this uh, forest into pasture. I mean, it's the, it's the ant effect. There's just you know, thousands of people out there who are trying to make a living. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's got to be a policy and enforcement almost kind of thing, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, in order to stop it. And that's why I don't think um, the resources or, or the you know, or the economic conditions are here right now. Right now, you know, Nicaragua is the poorest uh, country in the hemisphere other than Haiti and uh, people need to eat mm. and uh, growing cattle is, um, you know, it's probably the easiest business here, um, especially for people who don't have resources. So uh, I, I just, <laughs> the magic wand, I guess, to stop it would be uh, pay people who have a forest to just have a forest, you know? Mm. If you if there was a viable way to get carbon money in people's hands, you know, people who can't read and write, how do you get them a car? How do you get them carbon credits? So they just, you know, work their forest, maintain their forest rather than cutting it down. You know, that's the kind of thing that would have to happen. But I just don't see it happening, especially with the rhythm that the deforestation is happening. Mm. Uh, well, are my, I, I Really appreciate your time. Um, and mm -hmm. before we, we wrap up, do uh, you mind if I hit you with a couple of rapid fire questions? Sure. Cool. 
All right. So first off, what what's maybe a, a favorite book of yours or or something you read recently that you'd like to recommend to our listeners? Um, lately, I've been kind of obsessing on uh, EV conversions. Mm. Uh, there's just just really interesting the idea of me to me that you can uh, take uh, you know an old Land Cruiser or an old car, recycle a car and basically plug in a motor straight into the transmission, electric motor straight into the plant transmission and convert it into a, uh, um, you know, an EV, like a classic EV. So I don't know, that's kind of a side obsession I've had the last few months. In general, my tendency is towards uh, historical kind of books like David McCullough and that kind of thing. I'm always very interested to hear about how people did things, you know, 200 years ago. Oh, you know, these days it's almost too easy to do things. There's too much communication, too much movement, too much, you know, globalization. But 200 years ago, when you hear about, you know, Cornelius Vanderbilt, who controlled a trade route through Nicaragua and maybe came here once or twice, you know, that, that to me is like hard to wrap my mind around. He's sitting mm -hmm. at a desk in New York writing letters and <laughs> it was this global business. I don't know. So I don't know. I, I like historical books, to be honest. Gotcha. Where are you digging into the info on the EV conversions? I just got a couple of books off of Amazon, you know, yeah. obsessing on, on YouTube, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, the goal of eventually doing my own little project. Yeah. Is there, is there a type of uh, make and model that you have something maybe already in your possession? I want to do an old Land Cruiser truck Okay. to, to uh, drive to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Um, yeah. next one for you, do you have any particular morning routines or daily habits that you absolutely have to stick to? Um, I guess on a good morning, uh, my, my wife and daughters live down in a, in a beach town called San Juan del Sur. Hmm. So Monday morning, Friday morning, I usually wake up there. So a perfect morning, I wake up and, and go surfing hmm. and then, then get into work, you know, uh, take my daughters to school. That's a, that's a good morning routine. Uh, but then, you know, up here, uh, the, the routines more get up, drink some coffee and go to the factory in Managua. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> gotcha. And, uh, it's a good, it's a good balance between the two, you know, it sounds Having like a couple it. <laughs> days. Yeah. Uh, last one for you. What, what's maybe one piece of parting advice that you might give to the, the active or aspiring social entrepreneur? Um, I guess, uh, learn by doing and don't be afraid, you know, people, when they start businesses, the idea is like, I'm going to come up with a concept mm -hmm. and develop this product and someone else is going to make it and someone else is going to sell it. Mm. That's kind of the, the economy that exists right now. And, and also, you know, someone else is going to handle it. So, um, hands-on learning, you know, like, if someone else can make furniture, why can't you make furniture? If someone else can actually, you know, get the container to the U.S., why can't we get the container to the U.S.? So, like, I guess, you know, it's difficult. It takes time, energy, resources, but learning, learning by doing and, and not assuming that you, you can't do something, you know, mm. and that you have to find someone else, find some export expert to do it for you, or you have to sell to some big company or otherwise you don't have a business. Uh, I think that's that's kind of the cool thing that's that's available to us these days. Hmm. Um, yeah, and there's there's an abundance of of resources to you know learn almost anything that we'd like to. Yeah, I think that's that's excellent advice. Uh, there's a lot of momentum that that happens there when you learn one thing. You know, you kind of start to have this confidence that you can take on more. So I, I, I appreciate that that piece there. And so where should we keep up with you, Aram, uh, and in your various companies and, and projects? Where are the best best places for folks to go? Well, uh, Masaya Co. on in Instagram, we're, we're putting up a couple photos per week of our uh, lovely furniture. And uh, MasayaCompany.com is our, is our furniture company. Um, and the new prefab concept is called Guayacan Homes. So... Those are, those are our outlets and uh, we're available all over the U.S. for anyone that wants them. <laughs> all right. We'll have things uh, linked up in the show post at growensemble.com. Thanks so much. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time.